morning. This is Sky Nodestein with the South Florida Water Management District. I want to welcome any participants that are here online to join us for our Loxahatchee River Watershed Restoration Project Rural Development Workshop number two, being held at 10 a.m. on February 22nd, 2022. While people are logging on and, and, and attendees are joining this meeting, we're going to wait a few additional seconds before we start and give people more opportunity to participate. So stand by if you've already uh, logged in and we'll begin shortly. Okay, this is Sky Nedstein again with the South Florida Water Management District. I'd like to welcome all attendees and also the district panelists for attending this second rural development workshop for the Loxahatchee River Watershed Restoration Project. I wanna thank everybody for taking time out of their busy schedule and participating in this public workshop. We appreciate your attendance and I value the comments you've provided at the first workshop and today's. So with that in mind, uh, let me just rehash the Zoom format that we're gonna utilize for this work virtual workshop. It will be recorded. And if you wish to watch this workshop recording or the previous one, you can go to YouTube and look for the South Florida Water Management District channel. Um, workshop participants will be muted during presentations, but we will have a public comment portion in this agenda and we'll utilize the question and answer feature on Zoom. And if you do utilize this question uh, feature, please include your name and affiliation. And if there's a relevant agenda item or speaker to address, uh, please include that in your question as well. So uh, this is gonna be our workshop agenda for the second rule development workshop. I'm gonna uh, basically give a brief summary of the workshop number one, following a welcome statement by our Water Resource Division Director, Mr. Lawrence Glenn. Also talk a little bit about the water protection overview and rulemaking processes. Then we'll go over the technical document and the comments and revisions that were made in response to workshop one. We'll do the same for the uh, applicant's handbook uh, and talk about what changes were made there. Then we'll open it up to the Q&A feature of public comment. I'll finish with our next steps and where you can get links for additional information. And that'll be it for this uh, workshop number two. So with that in mind, um, I'd like to uh, welcome Mr. Lawrence Glenn. He is our director of the Water Resource Division here at the South Florida Water Management District. And Lawrence, if you're available. Thank you, Sky. Um, I just wanna echo Sky's comments on, thank you for the participation we have here today from the public. Uh, your involvement in this process is critical. Um, it, we really appreciate the, the insight that you all have that you bring to the table. Uh, we got comments back on the rule language that we'll go over today. And, and having this interaction is so important for us to help get these rules written in the best possible way for everybody involved. So thank you so much for being here today. The focus really is going to be going through uh, the language that was presented at the last workshop and going through and showing the changes and how we have incorporated comments that have been made and, uh, and maybe some comments weren't made and that's an opportunity for us to discuss, you know, why the language is as it is. But we, we really appreciate you being here today, taking time out of your schedule to help us get these rules right. So thank you so much. The team has worked really hard uh, over the time from the last workshop. And I think you'll find the, the rule language has, has really uh, improved since it was first rolled out. So thank you very much. All right, 
Thank you very much, Lawrence. I appreciate it. It's well said. Okay, so um, I think it's useful to just provide a brief summary of workshop number one. And, and part of that is that workshop and this workshop's purpose, and that's to get stakeholder input on our proposed rules and applicant's handbook for water use permits, and also on our technical document that supports uh, our rulemaking effort. And this uh, rulemaking is a component of the Northwest Fork of the Loxahatchee River MFL recovery strategy. So it's important in that regard as well. And then also I have to mention, of course, that the Loxahatchee River Watershed Restoration Project is a CERP component, and it is also a part of the MFL recovery strategy. So as we discussed in workshop one, CERP projects do need uh, their water protected, that water that's made available for the natural system, and the district utilizes water reservations and water allocations in addition to all the other implementing permit criteria that are associated with both of those. Also, just as a reminder, our workshop one presentation and other associated items are available on our webpage at the rules webpage of the district. Okay, with that in mind, uh, when we go to the water protection overview, I'm going to uh, turn it over to Jennifer Brown. She's going to talk about the highlights of some of the next several slides. Good morning, everybody. And again, thanks for joining us today. So um, just to go over some of the tools in the toolbox that Chapter 373 provides. So <clears throat> this, this, the statutory scheme provides for uh, various levels of protection. It talks about MFLs as the point at which withdrawals would cause significant harm to the water resources area. It talks about allowing the the water managements to reserve from allocation of volume of water necessary for fish and wildlife uh, or public um, health and safety. Uh, the consumptive use permitting rules are to protect the resources of the area from harm from withdrawals. And then water shortage is designed to protect against serious harm. And this scheme that is uh, laid out in chapter 40A, and that's the table that's associated in the rule, if anybody would like to go through that. Also, the definitions of um, harm, serious harm, significant harm are, are laid out there and, and spelled out in blue. Also, those are defined in, in chapter 40E8. And as Sky mentioned, both uh, the Water Resources Development Act of 2000 that authorized SERP as well as section 373.470 of the Florida statutes, authorize the water management district to use its reservation or consumptive use permitting authorities to protect the water that the project makes available. And that is um, what we've done here. We've used our consumptive use permitting rules. And we'll talk a little bit later um, ab about the decision. If you'll scroll forward, Sky. So again, here we are in the rule development process. The governing board has already authorized rule development. We've done analyses. We've uh, prepare, prepared some draft rule language and um, received, received phase one of, of stakeholder input. And we've attempted to um, address a lot of that input through changes to not only the rule, but also to the tech document and we'll go through those today with Sky. Um, and then the rule does need to be presented to the governing board for authorization to publish the notice of proposed rule. And that'll kick off some time deadlines um, from chapter 120. Once those timelines have passed, we will file the rule with the Department of State and those rules will become effective 20 days after signing, after filing, sorry. Next slide. And so here we are with translating a lot of those dates in chapter 120 to uh, the calendar. Um, so here we are at February 22nd with our second rule workshop. We are aiming for the April board for the notice uh, authorization to publish the notice of proposed rule and we will seek automatic adoption um, pending no additional comments from OFAR and JAPSI. Um, and that would, uh, 
put the rules effective during the summer and allow us to execute the project partnership agreement where we can reserve, um, which we need for our cost share for CERT projects. So I think that is it for me, slide, uh, Sky. That is. Thank you very much, Jennifer. Appreciate it. And we'll hear back from you uh, a little more discussion about the public comments received. Okay, so another thing we talked about in workshop one was the actual CERT project, and that is the authorized plan, also known as ALT-5R. Um, this plan maximizes restoration benefits for the project cost and constructability. And it is, as I mentioned before, a early identified CERT project in Northern Palm Beach County and Southern Martin County. And it has a large project study area that encompasses a bunch of Southern Martin County and Northern Palm Beach County. Much of the natural lands in, in this area are incorporated into uh, the overall project design. Now the goal is to improve flows by restoring watershed connections to the Northwest Fork, the Loxatchee River. And that in turn will improve both, both the wetlands in the watershed, their connectivity, but also the floodplain and the freshwater portions and of the tributaries and the river itself. That in turn will also support the tidal estuarine communities um, and the fish, flora, fauna, wildlife found in all those areas. One other thing is that uh, increased wetland function is going to tend to support plant and animal abundance and diversity. And there are a number of threatened or endangered species both within the watershed or the waters of this greater study area. So there are multiple components and they are grouped largely into three flowways. One of those is flowway two and a key component of that is C18 West Reservoir and associated for storage and recovery well systems. And then I know it's small, but on here is a, a, a excerpt from the CORE's integrated delivery schedule, 2021 draft update. And it just lists the various flowways and their start dates and completion dates. Right now, um, it's my understanding that the scope of work for flowway three is being developed. Pre-construction engineering and design is being done. Uh, this will allow for detailed studies such as surveys, geotech, if there's a need for additional water level or flow monitoring, and also that detailed design to begin construction. We're also hoping to have a uh, project partnership agreement and a pre-project cost agreement uh, executed sometime over the summer or fall of this calendar year. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and get into the public comments that were received following workshop one. And I'll just mention at our first workshop we had in January 25th, um, approximately 90 attendees, not including the district panelists, and most of those attendees were able to uh, stay for the full workshop. During that workshop, we did have approximately seven questions that were answered by staff in real time. And then afterwards, we received four written comments those being from Palm Beach County, the city of West Palm Beach, Don Medellin, a private citizen, former district employee, and well-versed in this activity, and a Mr. Richard Roberts, also a private citizen with a long background, I believe, with the Johnson Dickinson State Park System. Some of those general comments could be distilled down into uh, why restricted allocation instead of water reservation, and we'll talk about that and also have reflective changes in our tech document and applicant's handbook draft rules. Also, some of the general comments were related to what formal names were being used in our documents and rule language or associated figures. And then we had some general comments related to what was the technical basis for our ASR protection. In other words, our groundwater protection buffer. Now, for each of these, I would um, encourage people, as, as Jennifer mentioned, there are Florida Administrative Code, other water use implementing criteria. There are the MFL or Reservation Florida Administrative Codes and Chapter 373 broadly that contain a great deal of information if you're 
interested in the background of all the water protection measures that this district and other districts in DP utilize. Um, that goes as well for our, the technical basis for our ASR protection. It's well described in our technical document what modeling was utilized, and that's the mod flow model. The model parameters were described and shown, and the results were shown as well. We have multiple figures that show areas of drawdown, uh, likely expanse of ASR stored water bubbles, if you will, and then uh, a graphic that's used to help a uh, water applicant or other interested party better orient themselves to additional water use permitting criteria that may be expected uh, related to that ASR system. We'll also talk uh, a little bit more about why a restricted allocation area instead of a water reservation. And I think that one reason is we've had prescriptive documents in the past uh, that mentioned water reservations would be done for associated components related to projects that support the Northwest Fork of the Loxatchee River. And people are familiar with water reservations. Um, here in South Florida, Water Management District, we have seven water reservations. And at Picky and Strand, Fakahatchee Estuary, those were established in 2009. North Fork of the St. Lucie River, 2010. Central Biscayne Bay, 2013. C43 Reservoir, 2014. And then most recently, the last two, last year, 2021. And water reservations, people understand that they set aside water for fish or wildlife. And technically, they could also be used for public uh, health or safety, but we don't use a lot of at this district for that purpose. Um, but existing legal, legal users of water are protected. And also with this district, water reservations are included if they're planned to be implemented on annual MFL priority lists and schedules. So I'll just point out in 2013, the LOX reservation plan was removed from South Florida Water Management District's MFL priority list, primarily because it was understood that the United States Army Corps of Engineers accepted allocations as an equal project protection for water created, whether it was a water reservation or an allocation of water. And ultimately, um, even water reservations need implementing criteria. And, and for that subject, I'd like to just also switch over to the restricted allocation areas in this district. And we have uh, quite a few. Some of them, the oldest, may be the Florida and Aquifer Wells in Martin and St. Lucie counties, established in the 1970s. Many of the others in the early 1980s. In 2007, the Lower East Coast Everglades water bodies and the Northern Palm Beach County slash Loxahatchee River watershed water bodies were added. And most recently, in 2008, the Lake Okeechobee service area. And you can see the uh, graphic aerial coverage of each of those in the figure. One thing I do just want to point out is that all of these, whether it's a water reservation or a restricted allocation, they really all rely on implementing criteria. Um, those implementing criteria being found in the applicant's handbook. Those criteria found in Chapter 40E-2, consumptive use. And during times of drought, 40E-21, our water shortage plan, or 40E-22, a regional water shortage plan. What's important for me too is to think about can this project be constructed and waters that it develops for natural system restoration also be protected? And the answer is yes, whether restricted allocation or water reservation is needed. But the restricted allocation rules that we have in place since 2007 largely covered the geographic extent of this SERP project. And it was necessary only to increase a few areas to include uh, surface waters and natural water bodies to ensure that the entire project could be protected. And again, um, we live in a water using region. So whatever water resource protection we adopt, we have to, 
we have to sort of relate it to the real world where water use is occurring, will occur, and is always projected to occur. Uh, drawdowns can occur even around water reservations or MFL water bodies. So ultimately we need our permitting criteria to allow for that to an extent, to some capacity level. And we need applicants to understand what those rules are when they come in to renew or, or develop a water use permit. And I believe that a restricted allocation area rule and an update of an existing one kind of threads that very good balance between real need, real world needs of water users and the protection for the SERP project. So with that in mind, um, let's let a real expert talk. Um, Jennifer Brown, would you like to add any? Hey, Sky, I think you did a good job covering a lot of it. And, you know, when you go back and look at, at the district's regional water supply plans, going as far back as 2000, the district always talked about, you know, let's reassess what we need after the lower, the lower East Coast regional water availability has been um, adopted and effective and, and let's reevaluate what we need. And so as Sky mentioned, the district did go ahead and do that and 2013 did remove the uh, water reservations from the priority water body list. And again, that was based on the, the acceptance of the Army Corps of Engineers of the restricted allocation area um, to as effectively protecting um, the water for available projects. And they did that for the Biscayne Bay uh, near shore central water reservation of the groundwater component, the water preserve areas. Um, we did rely on it during the EAA water reservation for once that water does get into the Everglades water bodies. And so we have used the, the, the restricted allocation area and they've so far been effective. Um, also, in, in doing a water reservation, you we do need to recognize that one of the conditions for permit issuance is that they an applicant will not withdraw reserved water. And so we do need implementing criteria in the consumptive use permitting. And the district staff really did take some time to think about it. Would we do another regulatory layer on top of what's already adopted and rule? Or would we tweak the LEC rule for the surface water components? And so we decided that that's the better way to go especially since most of the users have already um, had to comply with it and been complying with it. Um, we did realize that we would need some additional rules for the ASR component um, to protect and, and especially as AWS was gonna become more prevalent in the lower East Coast, um, potentially more people looking to ASR, we, we did take a look at our criteria and noticed it was a little bit lacking. And so we're trying to um, fix that, not only to ensure that the Locks River is protected, but also um, ASRs in general. And so um, that's what we did look at. And, and as you'll notice, especially in the Northern portion of the project area for the Loxahatchee River Watershed Project, um, there's a lot of components that don't have um, measurable points in order to look at the withdrawals and determine what's protected and what's not protected. It's coming in from the northern part of the um, estuary um, and, and not necessarily flowing over line art or a similar structure or potentially even um, at the mercy of third parties. And so we need to be able to develop a set of criteria that water users, applicants can truly um, utilize. And so that's what we've, we've tried to do here. And, and we thank everybody for their comments and trying to make the rule better. Um, and so that's a, a lot of the logic. Okay, thank you very much, Jennifer, appreciate it. And, um, and you know, as we receive comments, we can continue to discuss the pros and cons of these two approaches. Let's move on to the next agenda item, and that's the technical document, the comments and revisions that we've made. Condense this down to just two slides, sort of organized by the chapter of the technical document. 
And I would encourage people to go to our web page. We posted the revised technical document, the revised applicant's handbook language there, and they can review them at their own leisure. But these are the broad level changes that were made. Um, added some information about human induced alteration to the watershed, that real world watershed we're all finding ourselves living in. We added more background information regarding the development of the existing Lower East Coast Regional Water Availability Rule. We've also uh, strove to clarify names of the natural areas within our figures and description. We've replaced uh, a figure that came, I believe, from the Army Corps PIR figure 1-3 with a higher resolution version. And that just showed some of the existing natural areas and other map components. We've got a uh, new figure and additional details about components of the C18W reservoir in section 1.5. And that figure comes from the Army Corps PIR and some of its attachments and appendices. And it's really nice. It shows a conceptual layout of the, of the reservoir, how it will be connected to the existing or newly constructed conveyance systems and where the proposed ASR system would lie, that being along the Western border. Now, we also importantly clarified that ASR well locations have not been finalized. And we uh, include two in the modeling discussion that until ASR test boreholes or test wells are constructed, you know, we're not going to have better hydrogeological data to use in any modeling. And then we added details about the wetland restoration areas of the project uh, for clarity. And these were supported in part by we had staff with the Army Corps reach out and talk to the project managers and, and mention some of those items for additional detail. Now, under the remaining chapters of our technical document, chapters three, four, and five, um, we clarified the natural area habitats that were shown in several sections, clarified habitat use by mammals in the project area. We updated the map, the new RAA boundary, and I'll show that when we go over the applicant's handbook changes. We've added clarifying draft language uh, about the base condition of water use. And that's important to, uh, you know, both for the SERP project savings clause that existing legal users will be protected or at least uh, their quantity and equal quality water that they're using today. Um, we revised our ASR buffer zone or groundwater buffer zone conceptual diagram that, that is shown that three dimensional cross section based on comments received. And we've uh, clarified that the one foot drawdown contour lines shown in figure 5-5 are for the upper FAS only. I think some readers at first glance, because of the aerial image utilized in that map, may have thought that those drawdowns were for surficial waters or the surficial aquifer system, and neither is the case. Uh, the ASR system for this SERP project is focused on the upper Florida aquifer system solely. So it was appropriate that our modeling and uh, associated drawdown contour lines were also applied to the upper FAS. And that ties into, again, uh, it's, it's stated in the technical document, it's shown in our figure 5-2, that the aquifer systems in this part of the state and much of the state in Southeast are hydrogeologically separated. So where, domestic self-supply wells, both for drinking water, irrigation needs in this area, rely on the surficial aquifer system or surface waters. Uh, both of those are separated very distinctly by relatively impermeable confining zones. So with that in mind, uh, if you're interested in more of the details, uh, please see our updated or it's marked as revised technical document on our webpage. And I'll provide links at the end of this workshop for that as well. Let's move on to our next agenda item and that's the rule language comments or the applicant's handbook for water use permit revisions that we've uh, implemented. And I'm just gonna jump in similar to the first workshop 
kind of go through the key sections of the applicant's handbook. And I'm just showing you those that are either directly relevant or that we propose new language or receive comments for modified language. So this is not the whole applicant's handbook by any stretch. We'll also use a, a yellow highlighter to try and uh, point out things that may have changed between workshop one and workshop two. So under our definitions, and the applicant's handbook lists many definitions, but for the North Palm Beach County slash Loxachee watershed water bodies, there is a list of natural areas of surface water bodies uh, and other elements that are intended to help an applicant orient themselves and, and where um, what permit rules might apply to them. Based on comments and the need for simple improvements, We've uh, taken up that space between the splash line, minor thing. We've added in after surface the word water. And then we've provided additional detail on the actual water bodies. So we have uh, an addition to City of West Palm Beach water catchment area and Grassy Waters Preserve. We have the additions of the word natural area to Loxahatchee Slough, Hungry Land Slough. Pine Glades and Cypress Creek to reflect the official names as used by the County of Palm Beach. Then anything that was added uh, either at the first or second, first workshop or in between that and this workshop is underlined, anything proposed to be deleted is struck through. Let's go on to the next area that we are, are proposing changes to, and that's section 1.5.2, the special duration factors. Um, the Upper East Coast Regional Water Supply Planning Area. Now, this was, was somewhat described, but we've added to it that it's the surface aquifer system throughout the planning area and surface water in the interior Martin County and Northwest Locks Edge River water use basins and those are gonna be reflected in the figures we show below. To the extent that withdrawals and new seepage from the North Palm Beach County slash Locks Edge River watershed water bodies. Those water bodies we just mentioned in the definitions update. It's also important to note that we added uh, further descriptive text to number two, the Lower East Coast Regional Water Supply Planning Area. So before it's just the skein slash superficial aquifer system, the extent that withdrawals reduced in induced seepage from the central and southern Florida project. We've added and North Palm Beach County slash Loxahatchee River watershed water bodies to clarify that induced seepage affecting those water bodies or that area would uh, be covered under this restricted allocation. Except for the provision that stormwater discharge or wet season discharge occurs and may be available and that's separately described in the applicant's handbook. And we also mentioned the other water bodies around here, Lake Okeechobee, the CNSF project, Clusatchee River slash canal, and we've corrected a spelling error uh, for the St. Lucie River slash canal. Just to put this in, in context too, there are no changes made to the other subsections of 1.5.2, subsections A, C, or D. Okay, this is sort of the meat of some of, some of this rule as it applies the uh, 3.2.1, the restricted allocation areas. And these are source specific criteria that applicants have to consider. We've added uh, surface water and surface aquifer system to the water that this uh, restriction is applying to. We've uh, also mentioned that it, it applies within the Northern Palm Beach County service area. This is a service area that's shown in our water supply plans. And the Lower East Coast service area is one, two, and changed it from four to and three. We've added the interior Martin County and Northwest Loxahatchee River water use basins. And again, those will be shown in the updated figures that I'll bring up. No other changes to 3.2.1E. Uh, it is important to note though that this, this subsection is, is assisting in implementing water protection for restoration projects. And it's uh, confirming that water will not be allocated for consumptive use. 
Also, when evaluations of water withdrawn from water bodies around or in this area, uh, they have to consider, are there integrated conveyance systems that are hydraulically connected or tributary to or receive water from such water bodies? And um, any of those drawdowns or, or changes apply to both the secondary and tertiary canals. Okay, so I'd mentioned some updated figures. This is uh, referenced in 3.2.1e, the Lower East Coast Regional Water Availability section. And we had this figure 3-1 showing the Lower East Coast Everglades water bodies and major integrated conveyance canals. This figure was um, a little bit dated and difficult for an applicant to read. So we're proposing the figure on the right, which clarifies those uh, water bodies shown in this sort of grayish blue or purple gray. Those are the Everglades water bodies. And then we also have along the East Coast, the lower East Coast service areas, one, two, and three from north to south. To mention too, an update to figure 3-2. This is an example of what was existing Applicant's handbook and what was shown also at our first workshop. And then at our second workshop, we had pointed out, okay, here's the new areas, and, and they're circled in this uh, yellow ellipsis and also the dashed black and white lines. And you can see those three general areas where uh, additional water body areas are part of this rule now. Now we didn't change any of that, uh, let's call it purple gray color, the North Palm Beach County slash Loxatch River watershed water bodies from the figure you saw at the first workshop. But what we have added are some other water use basins, water use service areas uh, to help orient an applicant or permittee uh, to what also exists in this area. So in Southern Martin County, we have two interior Martin County water use basins. Um, over in Southern Martin County along the East Coast, we have the Northwest Loxatchee River Water Use Basin. And then in Northeastern Palm Beach County, we have the Northern Palm Beach County Service Area. And then related to the figure shown previously, 3-1, in the bottom right corner of the map, we have the Lower East Coast Service Area 1. So again, this is to help an applicant or permittee orient themselves and see where their water use might fall and what additional permit criteria they'd apply to. Okay, this takes us on to what we're proposing would be a new section G. And this would be for utilization of the upper floor and aquifer system near the C18W reservoir. This is pretty, this is an entirely new section, so all, all the text is underlined. However, I've highlighted here in yellow uh, those changes that were made between what people saw at workshop one and today's workshop. So again, I'd like to just point out that this is a narrowly uh, constrained restriction. It applies when allocating groundwater stored in the upper Florida aquifer system, aka the upper FAS, beneath the C18W reservoir, as depicted in figure 3-4. This uh, subsection assists in implementing the districts of the objective of ensuring that water necessary for the restoration of the Loxatchee River watershed is not allocated to consumptive use on permit issuance, renewal, or modification under these criteria. Goes on, the applicant should provide reasonable assurance that the requested allocation will not, and here's a change, adversely impact instead of withdraw from. So it's allowing withdrawals, just not adverse impacts or interference. The portion of the upper FAS underlying the C18W reservoir and associated buffer zone delineated in figure 3 4. This demonstration is provided with the following criteria pursuant to the impact evaluation provisions in subsection 3.1.2 are met. Just as an aside, 3.1.2 is modeling data. Section of the applicant's handbook 
it includes uh, A, basic impact assessment, B, calibrated numeric simulation models, and what steps an applicant would take. Again, to add to that, um, these demonstrations are met if one, the requested allocation will meet the requirements of section 3.7 below. And I'll mention section 3.7 is interference with existing legal users. And the definitions and mitigation are further described in section 3.7. Or the cone of depression for the requested allocation individually and cumulatively will not intersect the upper FAS groundwater buffer zone delineated in figure 3-4. So we've tried to add clarity and specificity to this rule. It's narrowly constrained to a groundwater buffer zone and area that could be influenced underneath the C-18 West Reservoir in the upper Florida aquifer system. And then we would provide a rule effective date when this rule becomes effective, we've got spaces in the bottom text for existing legal users in the upper FAS as of rule effective date, whose cone of depression intersects the zone delineated in figure 3-4, the use may be renewed. However, no additional allocations that increase the withdrawals impact beyond that of previously permitted use as of rule effective date will be authorized. So again, this allows water use applicants and permittees people living in the fiscal system, that is this region of the district, to continue, continue their needed water uses while protecting the natural system requirements for this SERP project. We go on and show this figure that I've mentioned a couple of times, figure 3-4, changes in highlight yellow since the first workshop, uh, a little bit to the title, protected area of the upper Florida aquifer system related to the CATW Reservoir Aquifer Storage and Recovery, ASR wells. Some changes that were made to this figure based on comment received, uh, we adjusted Hungary Land Slough natural area to more due north of the reservoir. We've uh, also changed the dashed line on the land surface, which is there just for reference as the C18 uh, buffer zone. The hash mark in the upper Florida aquifer system is labeled groundwater buffer zone. And then we have a one mile uh, icon to represent the space between that buffer zone and the perimeter of the C18 West Reservoir. Some remaining changes to the applicant's handbook. Uh, some Minor language changes to 3.7, interference with existing legal users. We've uh, changed instead of withdrawals, but uses. And that's uh, related to proposed withdrawals of water together with exempt or permitted uses within the code of influence of the proposed withdrawal will not result in interference with those existing legal users. And then under 3.7.2, we've added the word and between with and existing. No changes made through subsections A through D. We do have an added subsection E, and this is related to the ASR system protection needs. If the existing legal use is an ASR system, one, the transmittance of ASR waters away from the area of influence by changing or accelerating the flow velocity or flow direction, or two, a change in the concentration of dissolved solids. And then last change in the applicant's handbook is under section 3.7.3, and these are mitigation requirements for interference with existing legal uses. We've added one sentence, and that's at the conclusion of the first paragraph. And this is a longstanding water use permitting uh, provision that interference would, if caused, uh, will require mitigation. But we've added, if the existing legal use is an ASR system, replacement of the impacted user's equipment shall not be included in the mitigation plan. So this does not require somebody to come in and replace a multi-million dollar ASR system. Rather, it would be to, if needed, if interference was being documented, 
been some modification, perhaps, of well location or pumping operations or other well field management, those could be changed so that interference was not caused, but not requiring ultimately any replacement of an ASR system. Okay, with that in mind, those are the changes that we made to the applicant's handbook and prior to that, the technical document. And at this point of the agenda, we'd like to open it up to public comment. I'll just mention again, we're going to use the question and answer feature in Zoom. So uh, attendees, this is a sub-menu on your Zoom platform. And I'm going to uh, phone a friend and ask Miss Natalie Kraft, who is monitoring our questions, um, if she has a first question, their name or affiliation, and if there's a relevant agenda item. Good morning, Sky and everyone who's attending. Can you everyone hear me okay? Yes. Great. Um, so far, we do have one comment um, that has been submitted via the Q&A. Um, we will give people time as well to add to that if they'd like to uh, type in a comment. We'll start with a comment from Jay Foy. He is the engineer for the Indian Trail Improvement District. Um, he did submit comments, a uh, written comment um, on February 7th and is reiterated here. Uh, please note Indian Trail has neither supported nor opposed the Waxahachie River Plan. Our Board of Supervisors has not been approached by the Corps or SFWMD. Yet the plan is dependent on some of the works of the district, which is the Indian Trail. I have represented Indian Trail for almost 30 years and we have fully wholeheartedly supported past efforts for the North Palm Beach County Plan. I've also actively participated in the development of the Waxahachie River Plan. When will Indian Trail uh, when is Indian Trail going to be approached by the Corps or district? And a new concern is the SFWMZ will protect water made available from the project. The estimates of water from Indian Trail are believed to be too high. Concern is the project will take water away from Indian Trail when we need it for fire protection. I will note that this um, effort is for the rural development to protect project waters, um, but I am going to, uh, again, phone a friend, like I said, and I'm going to let our um, third project planners and managers uh, take this one. So Jeff, if you'd like to weigh in here on, on Mr. Force comments. Sure, thanks Natalie and uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, Jay, to kind of address your comment there, um, we're looking to start design of the Flowway 1 and Flowway 2 features in uh, 2023. Um, so, I think at that point we would uh, reach out to you all and, and, and start those, those conversations. Um, but in terms of what we're looking at, according to what's in the PIR, um, we've, uh, we've got a 75 CFS pump station uh, that would deliver the water from the lower um, M1 basin in the ITID into the, uh, the M canal, with the city of West Palm. Over. Okay, great. Thank you, Jeff. A second comment has come in um, from Edward De La Part, attorney representing City of West Palm Beach. My question is as follows. In figure 3-2, did you mean to exclude the northern triangle of Grassy Waters Preserve from the northern Palm Beach County service area and the lower East Coast service area one? And if so, what was your reason um, excluding this area? Um, I can answer that and I'll also ask Guy to weigh in when I'm done. Um, that is something that we noticed um, later in the process. We are working with our GIS department for trying to determine why that triangle is not currently in our GIS coverage um, for, for those two service areas. Those service areas um, are rather uh, old. <laughs> Some of the water use basin lines that we've seen um, haven't quite coincided, and we are working through that with our GIS department. Um, so if it really is um, that it should be missing, we will reach out regarding that. Um, otherwise, it should be corrected once we can determine why it's missing. Sky, did you have anything to add to that? Uh, just that, and that's a good explanation. We have long existing water use basins and service areas 
multiple coverages. And many of these were started, uh, from my understanding, the 80s. Uh, so GIS has evolved a lot over the years to our, all of our benefit. And if any stakeholders can see where there's some improvements needed in those boundaries, please bring those to our attention by comment. Uh, written comment would be helpful. And then we can work with you and regulation of water supply planning to see if any boundaries need to be changed. But we've, we've uh, gone through considerable effort to show these accurately and, and try to ultimately just help uh, a user of the applicant's handbook better orient themselves to what conditions may exist. Sorry. Okay. Great. Thank you, Sai. Next question, also from Edward de la Part, is um, Does the addition of the words surface water and superficial aquifer system to section 321E? Of the applicant handbook, uh, mean that withdrawals from the Biscayne Aquifer are now excluded from the Lower East Coast Regional Water Supply Planning Area Restricted Allocation Area. Um, no, that's not going to exclude the Biscayne Aquifer. Um, we do see that as part of the surficial aquifer system as well, but I'm going to let Jennifer Brown uh, weigh in on that one as well. Right. Um, down the, the birth, we do rec recognize that the Biscayne Aquifer does pinch out. Uh, I believe it's mid Palm Beach County. I'm not a hydrogeologist, so I could be misremembering my map there. But down south, the, the Biscayne Aquifer and the Surficial Aquifer are, uh, I believe, are the same. So we can make a clarification there, um, but it's not meant to be excluded. Bob, did you want to add anything? No, that's uh, that's accurate. Okay, thank you. Okay. We have another question coming in from Jay Foy. How can the rule precede the institutional agreement that allow the project to be built? I go that. I'll, I'll take a stab at that, Mr. Foy. Um, when the district and the Army Corps enter into a project partnership agreement ahead of actual construction. One of the requirements, both from the state and the federal government, is that the waters from these projects have some legal protection. Uh, hence our discussion on water reservations and or restricted allocations. So we are following that timeline of adjusting water protection rules, and that's what we're doing uh, ongoing since December 2021 and, and hope to have accomplished by this summer. And then those uh, adopted water protection rules will allow a project partnership agreement between the Army Corps and its local partner, the South Florida Water Management District. That will in turn lead to future construction. Okay. Thank you, Guy, for answering that question. Next is a comment from Don Zellin, as a private citizen. I like the adjustments made to the rural language and technical document based on comments received. Nice job, everyone. Thank you, Don. Uh, a new concern from Jay Boy. Uh, SFWMD will protect the water made available from the project. The estimates of water from Indian Trail are believed to be too high. Concern is the project water will take water from Indian Trail when we need it for fire protection. Um, that is the comment that came up earlier. Jeff, do you have anything additional to add to that? Hey, Natalie, sure. Uh, Jay, yes, um, there's gonna be in that agreement um, certain target water elevations that are, um, that are going to be met during the wet season and dry season to, um, to address that concern. Um, according to the, uh, the PIR um, in, in, the, um, in the dry season, we're looking at um, 15 NGVD. I'm sorry, in the wet season, we're looking at 15 NGVD. And in the, in the uh, wet season, I believe it's 17. Although I'll have to go back and double check that. Over. So good afternoon and morning again. It's Jennifer. So one of the requirements in, in developing the PAR and the district recommendation is making sure that we comply with the savings clause analysis and also 
our requirements under section 373.15015 um, to make sure that um, the existing level of flood protection as well as existing water sources are not transferred by the project uh, um, unless and until new source is made available. And so it's my understanding that Indian Trails Improvement District has a water use permit. They've been complying with the LEC regional water availability rule, which is at issue here. And a portion of that allocation does include fire protection. And so um, the, the agreements will need to be um, uh, executed between all the entities as, as Jeff has mentioned. And I believe um, as we do a project operating manual for the, for the project, um, we'd be looking at existing source, existing legal users and, and the level of flood protection as well. Yeah, uh, if, if I may add, this is Sky to Mr. Foy. Um, yeah, the ship has not sailed on this. The flowway component related to Indian Trails Independent District is flowway two. Uh, detailed design for that flowway will start fiscal year 2023. And over the next several months, there's going to be a great deal of preparation to uh, reach out both to that independent district and others within the various flowways of this project. And, and as Jennifer stated, there is a savings clause. Your existing levels of flood uh, prevention will and must be protected, as well as your existing water use. If anything, this is going to be a long-term benefit during wet season, or let's call them excess flows, to help drain those excess waters. This is not a way to take water during drought. You will still be protected with your water supply and flood protection needs. Okay, thank you everyone for that. Uh, Jay did add in a note that ITID does not have any water use permits. We will fall then back on uh, the savings clause analysis. You guys will still be um, under that process. Um, and like I said, that it's only the excess flows that will be removed. That concludes what we've got so far in the Q&A. Um, we'll give people more time if they have something to add to that. Uh, I do actually have another one um, coming in from Mr. Foy, and we've got another. So please note that although the project separates the upper and lower M1 basins, they are connected. Okay, we will look into that um, as part of the, the project. Thank you, Mr. Foy. Uh, and the next one that we have coming in is from Richard Roberts. Will this rulemaking be added to the Lock Apache National Wild and Phoenix River Management Plan, which is being revised now? Um, okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, yes, as Mr. Roberts mentioned, the management plan is being updated. And this is, uh, you know, there are multiple stakeholders involved in that. The district is but one component, but yes, it's my understanding that district staff will update the water protection section of that management plan. And it can, I, I don't know the exact timeline of the updated management plan, but we will certainly provide the current, as it stands, updates um, towards that plan. And we also appreciate Mr. Roberts' uh, participation. He's provided some helpful maps to me uh, to help orient myself to the watersheds of the river. So thank you for that. Okay, great. Um, and we do have a comment to come in. Yes, Mr. McBrien, we do see your hand. We just wanted to go through Q&A first. At this time, we will ask um, Devon if you can unmute uh, Jeremy McBrien so that he may provide comment. Hey, good morning, Jeremy. everybody. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. All right. Hey, thanks, Natalie, and thanks, Lawrence, and Sky, and Jennifer. Um, again, I, Jeremy McBrien, Palm Beach County. Uh, we definitely appreciate um, the activities here today, and and up until this point, uh, you know the county's been supportive of Loxatchee River restoration for a long time. Uh, we do, um, I, I think, we'll, it, it appears like some of our comments that we provided have been addressed. So we'll, we're going to take a look and see uh, 
the details of what was presented today and take a look at the documents. Um, I think um, the timeline still looks a little short. I think um, you know, having a rule proposed or adopted by April based on a public comment period ending March 7th definitely feels pretty aggressive, but um, we will try and give you some feedback here uh, as, as quick as we can. Uh, I think because some of the things we're still trying to figure out is is kind of on a layperson's understanding of how this rule will affect some of the county's natural areas that we've invested quite a bit of money in in restoring and maintaining um, and sort of the interplay between the region's canal system water bodies and the the county's own natural areas um, and so, so some of that will be helpful at some point um, and then I think you know again the this is kind of groundbreaking for ASR protections for a CERT project. And so uh, I think we just need to be real careful and, and methodical about how this moves forward. So again, we'll, we'll take a look at what you've done to date and uh, look forward to work with you as this moves forward. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Jeremy. Yes, let me second that. Thank you, Mr. McBrien. We do appreciate your input and participation. And it is making our effort better, and, and uh, we appreciate that. Like everything these days, we need it yesterday, and we're all moving so fast. But uh, we do appreciate your additional review and comments. I would say, you know, existing legal users are complying with the regional water availability rule, so I see no impact there. And this is this is not a water taking. So natural areas that rely on water inputs are ultimately primarily driven by rainfall and precipitation and climate patterns. So we're all subject to that. I think that's being the bigger driver of potential future change versus any uh, water use permit rule changes. Okay. With that, I don't have any other hands raised or anything in the Q&A. Um, we can give it another minute if anything comes up. Uh, okay, I see Mr. McBride, your hand is raised again. Hey, yeah, sorry, I thought, thought of one more thing. Can you hear hear me okay? Mm hmm we can. I, um, I think it was the city of West Palm Beach that raised the issue about this rule potentially um, translating into a larger permitting issue and the uh, idea of involving more stakeholders that may not be paying attention because this appears to be a very focused Loxatchee River effort. Um, just wondered to maybe get some thoughts on that, on that comment. I don't think I heard that, or I didn't see that being addressed in your, your comments, but I, but I may have missed it. Sure. Um, okay, Jennifer and Sai, do you guys want to weigh in on that one? So the notice of all the workshops were published in the federal uh, Florida Administrative Register, so everybody has access to um, the information. It's all posted on our website as well. And I, I believe we use um, uh, an email blast that we can send out again, which uses all of our um, regional water supply planning list of, of folks that we've um, maintained throughout the year. And that does have um, county members, planning councils, um, utility and entities and all that stuff. So it's a pretty broad spectrum of people. Um, and we can make sure that we send that out again. Yeah, I think perhaps the, the level of confidence for existing legal users is they've been complying with these rules uh, since 2007 or 2008, uh, but for the lower East Coast, Regional water availability rule or the Lake Okeechobee service area rules. So, existing legal users are protected. They're meeting the, the current criteria. Okay. 
Thank you, Sky and Jennifer. So we'll give it another minute or so to see if anyone else comes in and then we can move on. Okay, we have something in the Q&A uh, from Mr. Foy. To be clear, existing legal uses include exempt uses. Jennifer, would you like to weigh in on that or Simon and Alberto? Yes, existing legal uses do include exempt uses. There are not that many exempt uses. Uses for fire protection are exempt. Um, also, single family um, domestic wells are exempt by statute. Um, and then we've also created a couple of general permit by uh, rule um, that um, have criteria in chapter 40 E2 for complying with, um, but generally they don't submit applications, um, but uh, and also would be protected. So, and then of course, anybody with a water use permit is an existing legal user. Okay. Thank you, We have a new question that's come in from Jeremy Bryan in the Q&A. Uh, you mentioned this was just in finalizing a PPA. Is a PPCA also being prepared? Uh, Jeff, can you please weigh in on that? Sure. Hey, Jeremy, this is Jeff. Uh, yes, the answer to that question is the PPCA is being prepared. It's currently uh, being routed through SAJ on its way to SAD uh, for review. Over. Okay, thank you, Jeff. Okay, Natalie, are we showing any more questions that have come in? Nope, nothing else has come in at this point. So I think we can move on to our next agenda item. I will reiterate that if anybody has questions after the meeting, um, you're welcome to contact either Sky or myself um, and we will make sure that we can answer them for you. I'll hand it over to you, Sky. Thank you, Natalie. I really appreciate you facilitating the question and answer and the comments. So as just mentioned, our next steps, uh, again, existing agendas, the updated draft technical document, draft rule language, they're all available at this rules website of the districts. In today's presentation, the PowerPoint will be posted following the workshop as a PDF if you wish to review it. I believe the recording will be posted to YouTube under the South Florida Water Management District's page at some point as well. We do really appreciate and continue to solicit your written comments. And here's Natalie's email. We would ask you that your comments are received by March 7th, 2022. All comments received will be archived on the district's web board. And that can also be reached by links from the rules webpage or directly from that address shown. 
And this due date of March 7th for comments is really driven by our next steps and what district staff need to accomplish as far as the overall rule development schedule. We will seek governing board action, uh, permission to do a notice of proposed rule with draft rule language and rule adoption following that. And this will come up at the April 14th governing board meeting, hence our need for early comments to be received. And that will allow time for staff to incorporate them, reach out to the comment providers and, and seek to finalize our documents for the April governing board meeting. Ultimately, we're looking in a collegial manner to support a, an important CERP project. And as mentioned, project partnership agreements or pre-project cost agreements must be entered into and some water resource protections are also needed prior to those agreements taking place. Hence our need for summer 2022 effective date of these rules, uh, allowing the CERP project to progress. To say that uh, here are the links for additional information. Um, please check out all our drafts at the rules webpage. There's uh, an incredible amount of information provided at the CORE's webpage, including the actual project implementation report and the environmental impact statement and the numerous appendices uh, and uh, addendum, including detailed preliminary design plans. We're also fortunate we have a good district aquifer storage and recovery webpage. If you learn to wish to learn more about this technology, please see that website. And as we develop more restricted allocation areas, we're updating the webpage on that. And again, any comments, if you wish to see the ones received or provide new ones, they will ultimately go to our web, district web board. With that, I'd like to close on behalf of district staff. Uh, we very much appreciate your participation. Thank you for taking time out of your schedule to attend this workshop. Thank you for speaking up during the workshop or providing questions or written comments to date or in the future. All of that, I believe, will make a better technical document, better modifications to that in its handbook, and ultimately will support a better project for the Loxatchee River. So with that in mind, I'll conclude workshop number two and wish everybody a great day. Thank you very much.